after World War II, they began to think of combat as also a production process. The officer corps were seen not as gladiator heroes who were leading men in combat, but as war managers. In turn, the enlisted men were no longer the citizens of a nation, but they were workers. Managers and workers worked on a production line to produce deaths, and the product then was enemy body counts. From an American perspective, if the only thing that counts in warfare is technology and economics, both in your economy and how you translate your economy into your military, then we, it was impossible for us to lose. It, and in fact, in some units, it, kind of where the informal rule was, if you don't meet your body count quota, then we're going to like, you're not coming men off the field. There are stories of where people from different units had to fight over arms and legs to determine who was going to get the kill count for their unit. Search and destroy reached the point where if any, say you, many units burn down villages routinely, um, and then you go in a village and you burn it and, and you see there are bunkers there, because all everyone in Vietnam had a bunker to hide in, and you hear a noise, and maybe you, maybe you scream and try to get somebody out, but maybe you just throw the grenade in. Um, or people start to run away from you. And well, if they run from you, they must be your enemy. And so you shoot them, and you say, well, running becomes a sign of an enemy. We, what's in practice is this is the mere group, group rule. If it's dead and it's Vietnamese, it's VC. Any Vietnamese we shoot, we're going to count. We take a fresh new look at the Vietnam War from the highest levels of the generals and the planners to the perspective of the lowly enlisted man on the ground. You will never view the Vietnam War in the same way you did in the past. After spending this hour with us and the author of the new book, The Perfect War, tonight on Alternative Views. Sighting down the long barrel, I wait till front and rear sights form a perfect line on his body, and then slowly squeeze the trigger. The thought occurs that I have never hunted anything in my whole life except other men. Vietnam, America's longest war, its most costly war, its first military defeat, and its most nightmarish national trauma. People are still asking, what went wrong? How and why did the U.S. get involved? Was Vietnam a tragic mistake, as liberals claim? Did the U.S. lose because of self-imposed constraints, as conservatives claim? Could we have won the war if we just unleashed the military machine and bombed the North Vietnamese back to the Stone Age? What was the cost of Vietnam, the human cost, the political cost, the economic cost to both the United States and the Vietnamese? One person who has been researching these questions for over 10 years is William Gibson, who has just published a book, The Perfect War, Techno War in Vietnam with Atlantic Monthly Press. Bill is a graduate of the University of Texas where he did his undergraduate work and he got his Ph.D. at Yale University and is now a professor of sociology at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And we're very pleased to have you with us today on Alternative Views, Bill, to discuss your Vietnam book. This is an incredible book, uh, Bill. Uh, if you have read a lot about Vietnam or if you have never read anything about Vietnam, this is the one you should read because it shows the picture from the top, from the bottom, and it 
gives an explanation as to what really happened there and why things happened. Usually you come back with kind of an empty feeling of, of frustration or not really knowing, but you, after reading your book, you, you understand, which is incredible, incredible oh, thank thing. thank you. And you get the f emotional feeling, the impact, as well as what was happening in the mines. And these incredible stories like how the North Vietnamese were able to bring down American jets just by lying on their back and firing 45s and rifles up into the sky. But I'm getting ahead of the story. Yes, Bill, let's begin by talking about what, in your opinion, is distinctive about the Vietnam War. What, about, what brought about U.S. involvement in this ill-fated adventure? The most distinctive feature of the Vietnam War is that it was the first war in modern times to be fought from a managerial business perspective. During World War II, U.S. industry made a massive contribution to the war effort, and American military men and political leaders fully appreciated that effort. During World War II, the military partially adopted a business model of organization for their supply operation. After World War II, they began to think of combat as also a production process. The officer corps were seen not as gladiator heroes who were leading men in combat, but as war managers. In turn, the enlisted men were no longer the citizens of a nation, but they were workers. Managers and workers worked on a production line to produce deaths, and the product then was enemy body counts. So just as American society's strength, supposedly, was high technology, capital intensive business, so too would we fight wars as high technology, capital intensive warfare, and we would literally drive the other side bankrupt. So it's this production model of war, or what I call techno war, that distinguishes at a primary structural level Vietnam from other warfare. And so then in, th in this way, we couldn't lose because we were fighting a small, underdeveloped, untechnical third world country with peasants, basically. Exactly. From an American perspective, if the only thing that counts in warfare is technology and economics, both in your economy and how you translate your economy into your military, then we, it was impossible for us to lose. It was theoretically impossible for an underdeveloped peasant economy to beat the United States. It just couldn't happen. Therefore, whenever we ran into a problem in 454 or 60 or 64, at every time the U.S. was defeated, we always thought that if we escalated to the next highest level, we would win. It's a closed system. And Bill, why was Vietnam chosen as the site for the first techno war? Um, there's no historical reason for Vietnam. In other words, really Vietnam as a country, as a people, as a culture, didn't really matter to the Americans. So there was nothing about, about the country per se to make us fight there. It was simply the time when this whole apparatus of warfare was developing vis-a-vis -vis the time when the situation in Vietnam was deteriorating from an American perspective. Techno war, or, or this, this production model of war, got its big push in the 50s. Because after World War II, when we had the hydrogen bomb or the atomic bomb and then later the hydrogen bomb and the Russians didn't, it seemed clear to us that our, our mastery of the world was just unsurpassed and we could not be challenged. But when the Russians had the bomb, we were in a situation of potentially mutual destruction where they could destroy our industrial apparatus, then this made the Americans feel impotent. And so the question came is how can we develop a form of warfare to and exercise our power in the world without threatening nuclear war. And the idea developed by Dr. Henry Kissinger, who at the time was a professor at political science at Harvard, was what's called limited war. And the idea was because our economy was so big and powerful, we could have guns and butter, butter and TVs and popcorn and drive-ins for and hula hoops for the Americans at home, and limited war for an indefinite period of time in the third world. And because we were so much richer, we would just drive the other side bankrupt. And it was a period where certain guerrilla movements, certain national liberation 
movements were emerging. We saw the Cuban Revolution in 1959, and there were third world revolutionary movements throughout Latin America, the Western, Africa, the, Africa, South Africa. The East French Africa. and British empires were deteriorating worldwide. Certainly, right. in, you know, and Vietnam's a classic case of that. Vietnam mm -hmm. had been a French colony that right. went through a long process of revolt. So Vietnam was just simply, it was ready. We had our theory for limited war, and we had our apparatus in place at the time Vietnam was, was uh, well, by the time the French had been thrown out. Can you give us a brief uh, history of Vietnam and their struggle, first against the Chinese and the French, et cetera, leading up to American intervention? Certainly. The word Vietnam originally, it means Southern Kingdom of the Viet, and it was a uh, uh, part of China that, well, didn't really break off. It's like Chinese immigrated there, and they formed, they formed a racially distinct group and tried to declaim, claim independence. Chinese emperors would invade Vietnam, hold the country for several hundred years. Vietnamese guerrilla fighters would uh, throw the Chinese out. The Chinese would then invade and hold it for another 50, 100 years. Then the Vietnamese would throw them out and hold on for 50 years. This, this struggle between Vietnam and China for Vietnamese independence went on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Finally, by the time the Vietnamese had finally defeated China, they were in pride. They were weak, though. And the, but this is the time when the West was expanding, and France was looking for a way to get to China for the uh, spice trade and so on, and they ended up taking Vietnam. So France took uh, Vietnam as a colony in the 1890s. Vietnamese fought off and on against the French from the 1890s on up. Oh, they just kept on fighting. But then in World War II, the communist, uh, especially headed by Ho Chi Minh and Bo Nu Yen Jap and Lei Duc To, organized better. They fought against the Japanese, and then after declared their independence in '45, and ironically, American uh, intelligence operatives uh, supported that effort extensively. And Ho Chi Minh, as I understand it, looked at that time to the United States as a model to develop his country, not to the Soviet his, Union. His position was that he had paid off whatever he felt he ideologically owed to the Soviet Union, and that he was a free agent, he was not getting any assistance, and that the America, with the Declaration of Independence, and with its stated anti-imperialist policy, was a far better possible ally. And it was a model of democracy for him, too, and at that time he was a nationalist and a democrat to some extent. Cer certainly a nationalist. Uh, how, how much a Democrat? I'm not. I, I wouldn't. He was pretty he much. He at least paid lip service to mm -hmm. the Some democratic values that's, and the anti-imperialist. But certainly a nationalist. Yeah. Well, then the uh, Vietnamese defeated the French in '54 after mm -hmm. eight years of extensive warfare, extensive guerrilla warfare. And it's important for us to understand the war in Vietnam was one country. It had been tentatively divided into three administrative zones by the French, but warfare was going on on all three. When the war ended in 54, the country looked like a checkerboard. Some French in the north, some Vietnamese or Viet Minh in the north. Some French cities held in the south, other areas held by the, uh, by the, by the Vietnamese communists. North and South Vietnam didn't exist. It was only a checkerboard. But then, at the Geneva Peace Talks in 1954, there was a land swap. Vietnamese forces moved north, French consolidated their forces in the south. A line was drawn, a provisional administrative boundary, not a national boundary, not a political boundary, an administrative zone boundary. And the idea was the country would be divided for two years and there would be international elections in 56. There were no such inter, uh, elections. The United States moved in. But what's important to understand, this idea of North Vietnam as a separate country that invaded South Vietnam is wrong. There was no North and South Vietnam as two separate countries. That was a, uh, just a, it was a checkerboard at the end of 54 that got, that got changed. And what happened in the South to begin the resistance struggle? When the grill, when the, in 54, the Viet Cong in the South were told to put down their guns and that they were going to engage in political struggle for two years in preparation for the 56 elections. Uh, that became extremely dangerous. Uh, Diem, the man the Americans put in power, immediately went after and hunted down most of the communists, leftists, democrats, nationalists. In other words, Diem and his family ruled Vietnam pretty much as a dictatorship. Um, and finally, by the late 50s, the local 
communist and na guerrilla and socialist and democratic apparatus was taking casualties so badly that they had to renew the armed struggle to survive. And so simply then the southern cadres put pressure on the north, on the Communist Party, to like reopen the military front and have a joint political and military strategy as opposed to simply trying to wait for international uh, intervention or, you know, by the United Nations or something. So that, that's the origin of resistance. And what was the U.S. response to this then? Well, the response was quite simple. This is uh, when the Green Berets, who had originally been formed to parachute into Eastern Europe uh, after to organize guerrilla movements in Eastern Europe, got reformulated as counterinsurgency experts, and they were sent to Vietnam by President Kennedy in 1960. There was also a massive increase in CIA operations. The whole idea of covert warfare, remember, and, and counterinsurgency warfare, remember we had failed at the Bay of Pigs in 19, what, 61? Mm -hmm. And so the idea was that we must become experts at fighting these uh, wars of national liberation, and that we must have new warrior technicians who could intervene in underdeveloped countries and fix things. And the Green Berets uh, were one branch is fix-it men, CIA operatives were another, various logistics people, econ economists were, were others. Mm -hmm. We should remember, like, let's understand the class structure of Vietnam. It's a poor rural society. Most of the people are landless peasants or own very small plots of land. They're under subsistence agriculture, where a large part of their crop goes to the landlord. A small land-owning class, most pea peasants are Buddhist with practiced elements of Confucianism as well. A small land-owning class, a lot, many of them are refugees from the north, many of them Catholic, controls the nation's wealth. So Diem and the government, Diem, uses then the army as a mechanism to collect rents. And during the first war against the French, the Viet Cong had redistributed the land to the peasantry. So when Diem came to power in 54 with the army and, uh, and acted as agents of the landlord to collect years of back rent, uh, uh, essentially the internal class polarization increased one more time. And drove people in the Viet Cong into revolutionary perspective. Exactly. And then Diem had to use more and more repression as a result of the dissatisfaction of the... And the repression in turn people. meant that in essence that the, that the Viet Cong or communist forces felt like they had to resort to armed struggle again. So this is why you made your statement in your book that Ziem had an army, but he didn't have, he was not a government. That's right. No, there was no effective administration other than military administration. Diem eventually replaced all forms of village council, all forms of intermediary powers that, that had any linkage to, to below were destroyed. Instead, all loyalty was from the top down. Yet the American escalation didn't really dramatically accelerate until after Diem's assassination. What brought about this dramatic acceleration and what you call techno war to Vietnam? When Diem was gone, all the other Vietnamese generals began a power struggle among themselves. Consequently, whatever government repressive apparatus Diem had collapsed. Desertions increased radically. Defections to uh, Viet Cong units became stronger and stronger. By 64, American policymakers feared that there would be a provisional revolu revolutionary government, in an open provisional revolutionary government in much of the countryside, which we had lost. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's good straight. U.S. forces lost, or the French lost in 45. We lost again in 54. We lost again in 63, 64. We escalate, the American United States escalates in the face of defeat, mm -hmm. not in the face of victory. Right. So massive defeat in 63 and 64 brought in then the need for U.S. ground troops and sustained bombing of the North in order to try to salvage the situation. What, why couldn't the U.S. accept a defeat in this small corner of the world? The United States has been unwilling to deal with communism as a political, social, and economic movement. Instead, it gets seen that we as Americans are the natural beings of the world, and that capitalism is the natural economic order, and that our system is simply the essence of human goodness and the essence of nature. Therefore, something very, very different from us is not another society with whom one compares differences and makes treaties with, and so on and so forth, but instead, is an alien presence. If we're nature, they're anti-nature, or what I call the foreign other.
During World War II, the Soviet Union did take over right after World War II, did invade and take over Eastern Europe, the Red Army did, and you had to hold it as a buffer zone, and they did install puppet dictatorships there. This became the model for all American views of communist and socialist of any kind. Americans did not understand internal revolution. They did not understand the Chinese Revolution in the 40s that there were like millions upon millions of poor peasants who wanted land to survive and that Mao Zedong and the Communist Party offered them land and survival, whereas Chiang Kai-shek was a warlord who offered them nothing. So unable to see internal struggles for uh, socialism or communism or un unable to see even internal struggles for national independence against colonialism, right. the world gets divided into them and us. Mm -hmm. And we're the good guys, and they're the bad guys. They are the foreign other. They're trying to move in. So all forms of communism get, uh, movements get seen in that light. So in this sense, then, any particular movement in the world is not just a particular movement in a dirt poor country. And let's remember how dirt poor Vietnam is then. And we had very little investment there. Instead, any movement is a sign of the global movement. A victory, by the Soviet Union. A, a few poor peasants win in Vietnam. That doesn't mean just that they have, that a little few more people have a few more rights. Instead, that means that the foreign other, the monolithic machine, has encroached one more step, and that with each other step, the rest of the world becomes in peril. This, of course, is the domino, domino theory. theory. So like a contagious disease, sort of, instead mm -hmm. of like each country having its own history and its own culture and its own people. It's as if the world is an empty shell, like a chessboard, and it's either our side or their side, and you once they get going, just somehow a mechanistic momentum will propel communism to victory. It's a very, I call it mechanistic anti-communism mm -hmm. because it's a mechanistic framework of the world. Mm -hmm. And the enemy is, is foreign other. They aren't really real enemy at all. It's an abstraction. So isn't that also, aren't there two sides of this? The other side is the people, um, the big decision makers, the foreign policy establishment as you term it. Looking at the world on a more realistic basis, as uh, General Maxwell Taylor said in his book, we have to keep an iron grip on the third world country because they're poor and they want riches and the riches would have to come from us. So they look at any type of victory such, an e as, an e uh, such as in Vietnam as providing an example to other third world countries that if they can do it and get away with it in Vietnam, they can get away with it in other So it's countries. a universal sign. The victory in Vietnam was a universal sign of uh, national liberation victory everywhere. A defeat in Vietnam means that all liberation movements will give up their struggles. So, Bill, given the fact of uh, this military-industrial complex in the United States that had built up a new military machine and model of warfare, given the mechanistic anti-communism that was motivating the foreign policy decisions of the U.S. foreign policy establishment, and given the collapse of the DM South Vietnamese government in Vietnam, it was almost inevitable that U.S. involvement would intensify, that this war was not an accident, that this war was not just a policy mistake, but it was a consequence, basically, of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. industrial and military. Um, development since World War II, that this was the test case. This is where they had to test their war machine and stop communism. I really want to stress mm -hmm. together that I am one of the principal arguments I'm trying to like critique in my book is this notion that, that we just made one mistake after right. another, that nobody was really responsible for anything, that things just sort of slipped up. You don't go to war that way. You go to war far, far in advance. In 64, when Johnson was making announcements about the Gulf of Tonkin and just sort of like how it was a surprise attack, which it wasn't, um, and in early 65, when they were making announcements to the American public that maybe we'd send a few thousand more troops to Vietnam, they fully expected to send 200,000 people by the end of 65, they knew another 100,000 by 66, and another 100,000 by 67. It was the estimates were already there that it'd be a take a half million men. So they right, had it was, like, it was a planned war. out war. This was a planned warfare, mm -hmm. a planned escalation. Well, let's talk about the war itself and see how this techno war actually worked out itself in the ground and in the air. Uh, the use of helicopters, the helicopter war, and the search and destroy. Can you describe these and how they worked in the 
Well, let me quote a very famous general, Julian Ewell. Um, generals write books. They're kind of like academicians. They need to like write to publish in order to get further promoted up the hierarchy. We normally don't believe that, but I think that way, but it's, it's true. And to justify their actions. And just to justify their actions. <laughs> All right, Ewell's book is called Sharpening the Combat Edge, the Use of Analysis to Reinforce Military, Justi uh, Military Judgment. It's published by the Department of the Army. And in the first chapter, Ewell says that we could compare search and destroy operations in Vietnam to an assembly line. Wow. That it was, a, you know, a, literally a war factory, and that the objective was like, unlike a World War II or World War I, where you have a continuous front going on thousands of miles, and you have major offensives, and then a counteroffensive, and then a law. In Vietnam, it's a factory. You turn the factory on, you let it run full blast all the time. And that's the managerial problem. How do you just allocate your resources, given the fact that you've already decided to run at maximum capability? To produce body counts. To produce body counts. Search and destroy means that so somewhere between several hundred and several thousand American soldiers are going to search a block of countryside for Viet Cong or North Vietnamese troops, and they're going to try to engage them in combat and, of course, and destroy whatever troops or whatever supplies they capture. In theory, it's strategic offensive, meaning it's a way to, to put the Viet Cong, make them weaker, to put them on the, to hunt them down. It's as if we're hunters and they're the prey. The objective is to kill the enemy so fast that we reach what's called, really called the crossover point. This is General William Westmoreland's term. The crossover point means you're killing the enemy faster than they can replace their casualties. It's like you're going to drive the other side bankrupt. All right, so with all of our high technology, with our helicopters, our jet fighter bombers, our tanks, we'll put, just grind them up. Now, that's the theory. The practice of search and destroy often turned out very differently. In that part of simply, of a factory means a set of routine operations. And these routines were quite visible to the Vietnamese. For example, we just didn't all of a sudden show up unannounced into an area and begin the search. Instead, you had to like, reconnaissance planes had to go over it. Artillery guns had to shoot smoke rounds into the jungle, into the landing zone, so that all the other artillery guns could sight in, so they could, like, fire protective artillery strikes around the landing zone. If you're any kind of Viet Cong commander, if you see a smoke round coming up in the jungle, why well, you know that the Americans are getting ready to uh, launch a, uh, a helicopter assault. There aren't that many clear, zone, clear areas in, in mountainous territory or in swamps or in, or in jungle. You can tell where the landing zones are. So many times the Viet Cong commanders had a very substantial advance notice upon when the Americans were going to begin an operation. Consequently, they had the choice, do we run and hide or do we ambush? The Americans then land. The second or first wave takes the landing zone. The second and third waves bring in more artillery. If you're a Viet Cong commander, you get out your compass and your map. You draw a circle, a radius around their map, and that will tell you because you know that American artillery, a 105 millimeter howitzer, has a 10,000 meter radius. So you know that the Americans will not march further outside the range of their howitzers, so you can tell where the Americans are going to march. Do you run and hide or do you fight? So the so same kind of principle goes on. It's, it, it's in essence, they knew where we were, but we did not know where they were. And they had the uh, they had the initiative. They right? then had the initiative. It's their terrain. It's yeah. their terrain. So it has even by the military's own statistics, roughly three quarters of the battles in Vietnam were initiated by the Viet Cong and NVA, meaning they ambushed U.S. forces, and could make a decision. Also. Most battles ended when the Viet Cong and NVA wanted them ended. They could like initiate contact and break contact. And that's, those are two crucial definitions of combat initiative. And your other statistic that only in 2% of the search and destroy missions did we actually 
make contact, uh, original contact with the Vietnamese. So it was their choice the whole time. And as I understand, the soldiers themselves on the ground, they didn't like this because they were the ones who would have to take the casualties first to lure the Vietnamese into battle so that then the uh, Americans would know where to send the planes and where to send the artillery. You send out a patrol in order to get it ambushed, in order to mark a target with a smoke rocket from a helicopter or so, so that then the jets can come in and napalm the area. In other words, you have to get ambushed before you can find the enemy. You know, when I began my Vietnam research, I had a hint that I was going to find a very cavalier attitude towards whether or not Viet Vietnamese lived or died. I was surprised to understand the command's attitude towards their own soldiers. But let's think about it. We're talking about a production model of war again, or techno war. These are the U.S. war managers. These are the U.S. war managers. Okay. We have a draft. We can replace all the, ca all the labor that we lose can be replaced. And indeed, it's like migrant labor force. We're almost sort of like, say, we had a farm when you bring them in for a year, you know, a year or two duty. They're blacks and Chicanos anyway. Quite all, well, not most, but a whole lot of them yeah. are. They're, they're poor, working class whites. The idea was, so what if they walk into an ambush? We take some casualties that way, but then we'll call in our airstrikes and call in our artillery uh -huh. fire, and we'll use our technology then to, to, to get the body count. So, in essence, the ground troops were bait. They were being sent out on operations to be ambushed. And that's not a good way to survive in warfare. Night movement. That was suicide. That was one of the worst patrols you could ever go out on. The purpose of it was for you to walk up on Charlie and for him to hit you, and then for our hardware to wipe them out. We were using scapegoats to find out where they were. That was all we were. Bait. Hell, they couldn't find Charlie any other way. So they loved us to run into a whole bunch of them. That way they could plaster him and they'd have a big body count. Then the general gets another goddamn medal and a big promotion. Uh, let's also note again, the highest officer routinely on the ground during Vietnam was a captain. A captain was a company commander. A company had at most about 140 people in it. That would be at full strength. Most combat units never operate at full strength. Everyone above captain's level a battalion commander is the man who commands four companies. All battalion level officers, brigades, brigades command several battalions, divisions have several regiments or brigades. All the rest of those choppers, all the rest of those commanders are in helicopters flying at minimum at 1,500 feet because 1,500 feet is the maximum range of a 50 caliber machine gun when used as an anti-aircraft weapon, which until the latter part of the war was the largest anti-aircraft weapon the Viet Cong had. So the managers were relatively safe mm. in this process, whereas it's the workers who are suffering the uh, occupational safety uh, <laughs> hazards, real the hazards on, on the ground. Was it a success in terms of the numbers and the body counts? Did they actually, in their own inhuman logic, succeed? Or were the costs greater than the benefits, even in terms of their own logic? Several things happened. For one, all the American commanders and helicopters communicated in uncoded English to their subordinate officers and ground troops. The Viet Cong and NVA were able to buy American radios in the black market and capture others. They routinely listened in into all the orders. There are many stories of people of Viet Cong hearing American orders and then taking actions to circumvent them. So the sheer arrogance of, you know, we're in our helicopters, we have all this stuff, we don't have to care, we don't have to pay attention to our enemy, that ended up costing American lives. Mm -hmm. So that part didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it took, within a year or so, by late 66 or so, the Viet Cong and NVA knew how long it was going to take an American airstrike to get there. Now sometimes they can make a terrible miscalculation and get caught out in the open. But an astute enemy commander could 
make a reasonable judgment on how long he could stay in combat before he had to run like hell because the uh, F-4s or the, or the Hueys or the gunships were coming to after him. So a lot of times ambushes would be quite brief and the enemy would break off contact. Well, we've mentioned body count a couple of times. Let's get into that and the whole framework of corruption and lies and cover-ups that occur in the it's, U.S. It's simple from if we, we follow it so far. If the success in war is purely an enemy body count, yes, because we're trying to drive the other side bankrupt, and let's presume that, oh, you and Doug are, I'm a general, and that, like, your lieutenants are captains, right? Maybe you're a captain, com company commander somewhere. You're under pressure. I'm under pressure to produce a body count. And as a colonel, let's say I'm a colonel battalion commander, if I don't meet my quota, my career's over with. I'll, I'll be relieved of command. And if you're relieved of combat command, then your, your, your ticket up the hierarchy is, is gone. So I'm going to squeeze you. And in fact, in some units, it kind of where the informal rule was, if you don't meet your body count quota, then we're going to like, you're not coming in off the field. We'll just leave you, I'll bring you some more ammo, some more food, some more water, but don't expect, you know, you've got to like produce the goods. I knew if I came back without a body count or at least a prisoner, I'd uh, get my ass chewed. So I kept the patrol out. Well, I talked to, uh, <clears throat> to many soldiers who were wounded, uh, the ones I saw in Japan, and they told me that some units were given a quota for the week. And if they didn't get it, they were just sent right back out again. All right, you're under pressure. You're under severe, severe pressure. So what do you do? Well, you can do several things. One, you can just invent a body count. You can just out of the thin air and just like, uh, uh, say, uh, call up and have a, like, tell everyone in your unit, tell them, tell your entire class there at UT to fire off their M16 for about, uh, for a minute, called a mad minute, and uh, call up on the radio and uh, report that I have a, you have a body count of 30 or a body count of five or something like that. Or say you get ambushed, Frank, and your whole company gets ambushed. Um, and you call in an airstrike and you call in an artillery strike and there's an armored unit nearby. Um, and you actually have an engagement and you find some enemy bodies. Well, how are you then, what are you going to do? Well, if you found ten bodies and you've got three different units, artillery, air, and infantry involved, who's going to get the credit? What if you don't give credit to the artillery? What do you think might happen then? What if you say you fired but you missed? Does that sound like a wise policy to you? The artillery commander isn't going to give you any support. The he next might time be kind of slow <laughs> next time around. Or those F-4 pilots might have to have. Uh, they might get a little slow too. It's in your interest to reward everyone, and since everyone is under the same system, everyone needs body counts. Why, sure. We give you 50 Air Force, we give you 50 gunships, we give you 50 artillery, and we on the ground, um, well, I've got five bodies and I've got five rifles. We'll count each rifle as a five persons killed, so that gives us 25. And while we were out stumbling around, we found 10 enemy grenades. Uh, I beg your pardon, 10 graves. We'll count them too. Um, and it, body parts. And body parts. Say we find an arm or a leg, and say because sometimes really when the airstrikes did hit, you can blow people to smithereens. Unlike the war movie where everyone has a nice discreet death, yeah. in a real war, it's quite gruesome. There are stories of where people from different units had to fight over arms and legs to determine who was going to get the kill count for their unit. And of course it got, the, it got even more pernicious because they would slaughter Vietnamese civilians and include them, I mean, children, women, old people, and include them as part of the body count as well. Well, we should get clear on, on that about, in some areas of the war where U.S. forces were fighting uniformed North Vietnamese troops, there weren't too many civilian casualties. But a whole, whole lot of Vietnam battles occurred way inside the country where there were Viet Cong, and Viet Cong and the villagers were all, were very much the same people.
Well, now on search and destroy missions, they told us to kill everything that moves. So we killed everybody. Well, I just happened to be standing alongside the officer when the radio man said, Look, sir, we've got some children rounded up. What do you want us to do with them? And the officer says, God damn it, Marine, you know what to do with them. Kill the bastards. If you ain't got the goddamn balls to kill a Marine, I'll come down and kill the bastards myself. And the Marine said, Yes, sir, and hung up the phone. And about two or three minutes later, I heard a lot of automatic fire and a lot of children screaming. I heard babies crying. I heard children screaming their lungs out. Search and destroy reached the point where if any, say, you, many units burn down villages routinely, um, and then you go in a village and you burn it, and, and you see there are bunkers there, because every one in Vietnam had a bunker to hide in. And you hear a noise, and maybe you, maybe you scream and try to get somebody out, but maybe you just throw the grenade in. Um, or people start to run away from you. And, well, if they run from you, they must be your enemy. And so you shoot them, and you say, well, running becomes a sign of an enemy. Well, we'd been out for about three hours, and uh, really hadn't seen anything. It was too hot. But then I saw this figure in black pajamas running along a paddy dike about 300 meters ahead and to the left. And, oh, hey, I got one, I hollered. Ten o'clock, he's mine. And then I muttered the warning to halt, you know, regulations. Don't lie, don't lie. So I dropped to one knee, squeezed the trigger, crack. The figure in black went flying like a piece of paper in a gust of wind. Ho, we got some, Morgan shouted. Nice shot, baby, nice shot, said Newcomb. When we reached the body, I nudged the corpse face up with my boot. It was a woman, about 55 to 60. And Wally says, stupid gook, what'd she run for? Uh, we were um, in a free fire zone. And we saw women and a woman and a child running across, and the captain says, Well, there, there, they're running. Well, in the free fire zone, if they're running, they're wrong. They're the enemy. So we shot them. The whole squad opened up on them. The next morning we went out, and we could see the cap of a child that was bloodied, and you could see where the mother had dragged the child away. Troops are under, they're afraid, they're trying to survive, they're in a desperate situation, they're under a high pressure to produce a body count. They're, so yes, we got into sustained slaughter of Vietnamese villagers. You go through and you look at a man's hands, and if he's a true farmer, he has calluses, and if he's a gorilla, who's only a fake farmer, he doesn't. So you go and you look at the hands, and those, if he doesn't have enough calluses, then you haul him away, and you send him to a, an interrogation center. Or you look at the ankles. If a man is a gorilla, he must be running out there in the jungle getting his ankles all scratched up, where if he's a farmer, he wouldn't have so many scratches. So people would go, American soldiers would go around and look at the ankles. Or if he's a gorilla, if you actually mean you're a farmer by day and a fighter by night, you must not be getting much sleep. So you've got to have circles under your eyes. So U.S. soldiers would go in and look into the eyes of the Vietnamese and try to decide how many, how many bags they had. And then if you have too many bags, you get, you get hauled off. We, it was not our country. It was not our culture. We did not speak the language. And by the American way of looking at war, language, culture, history, class structure, these matters didn't, didn't matter. What matters is we had the hardware and they didn't. Well, as a pilot of a helicopter gunship, we had a rule about the use of evasive action. Anyone taking evasive action could be fired upon. They never explained why or even what it was. But anyway, there was one incident I recall where we flew over a large rice paddy, and there were some people down there working in the rice paddy, maybe a dozen or 15 individuals, and we passed over their heads. Well, they didn't take any action, but we could tell they were nervous. Uh, but they didn't try to hide or anything. 
So we uh, hovered uh, just a few feet off the ground among them with our two helicopters, and we turned on our police sirens, and boy, when they heard the police sirens, they started to disperse. And so we opened up on them, just shot them all down. Well, it was 6.30 in the evening, and uh, still daylight, and they said there was some VC out there, and they called on us, so we fired out there and killed off seven of them. Well, the word comes back to us that we killed seven rice farmers carrying their hoes or trying to make it back to the village. You see, we'd set up this uh, curfew, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., and so it was up to them to be out of there by that time. But hell, they didn't carry any wristwatches. They didn't have any idea what time it was. So, yes, people got hauled away for interrogation and never came back. Um, yes, many, many villages were burned to the ground and blown up. And yes, many, 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 many Vietnamese men, women, children, chickens, water buffalo, pigs, piglets, often were killed. Oftentimes you went into a village, the stories are you shot everything. And burned the crops. And, and burned the crops. And, and that their was, houses. Hmm? And their houses. And their houses. Boy, you know, if the people don't treat you right when you walk through that village, you can give them hell. Yeah, they give you that snotty look they can do. You know, they won't say nothing to you. And we expected them to run out and welcome us like that World War II type of stuff. You know, hey, hey, G.I., hey. Well, as soon as we step outside the village, the captain radios in, we're under heavy contact. Then right away, oh, those phantom jets start coming in and dropping them 500-pound bombs. The whole village is leveled. And we go on to the next village. And that is search and destroy. All this was, I guess, part of what you call the mere gook rule. Yes, essentially, if it's dead and it's Vietnamese, it's VC. You know, it's, oh, what it is, is armies have documents called rules of engagements that are supposed to specify when you can open up fire and when you can't. On civilians. Or uh, on whatever. anyone. Right. But they weren't used much at all. Mm. Instead, other kind of rules happen. Like I said, if they run, they're an enemy. Mm -hmm. Or if they uh, have black pajamas, that was one rule. Some units thought that any Vietnamese wearing black uh, garb was the enemy. Of course, all peasants that wore that as their national dress. Um, so there are all kinds of these fake rules that supposedly distinguish fin, friend from foe. Mm -hmm. But all these rules were wrong in that we just didn't know the culture. They were kind of like fabrications that Americans invented to try to make themselves feel legitimate about who got shot. Mm -hmm. and, oh, but ultimately, people saw through this and said, look, we were, and what's in practice is this is the mere group, group rule. If it's dead and it's Vietnamese, it's VC. Any Vietnamese we shoot, we're going to count. There's also, there's also the factor of racism, too. I sure. wonder how much they would have done this if they'd been fighting Germans. Oh, uh, it's, it's probably much less. Of course, or, it's racist. Gook, slope, slant, dink. One definition of a dead Vietnamese was believers. If they'd been napalmed, they were called crispy critters. And a one-liner went, When we kill a pregnant woman, we count it as two VC. One soldier and one cadet. Now what you do is you load all the friendlies, the friendly Vietnamese, onto ships and take them out to the South China Sea. And then you bomb the country flat. Then you sink the ships. I'd like to burn the whole country down and then start again with Americans. Bomb the schools and churches, bomb the rice fields too, show the children in the courtyards just what napalm can do, strafe the town and kill the people, drop napalm in the square, get out early every Sunday and catch them at their morning prayer, throw candy to the Arvin, gather them all around, take your 20 millimeter cannon and mow the bastards down. Yeah, and this also tapped a certain sadism, not only in soldiers in the field, but also intelligence people. There were people who would, you know, collect ears and uh, uh, 
fingers and even heads and even intelligence people would, would, would admit that they really got off to beating up the uh, people they were interrogating. But, you know, it gave them a nice buzz, a thrill to do it. When you go through soldiers' novels and memoirs, many have made valiant efforts to try to talk about the perverse eroticism of warfare. Um, a real, as you say, it isn't clearly a very strong sadist dimensions, a lot of rape uh, in the field, as well as killing, or a lot of rapes followed by killings and mutilations. Well, we'd, uh, we know well, maybe four or five of us, we'd go into the village and take a girl and bring her out into the jungle. We'd tell her to lie on the ground and don't scream, otherwise we'd kill her immediately. And then, uh, well, how many of her guys there were, well, they did what they want to with her. If the guys were in a good mood, they'd let her go. They weren't. They'd kill her. Well, the girls were um, unconscious after they'd been repeatedly raped. And then after they got through raping them, three of the GIs took hand flares and they shoved them in the girls' vaginas. The girls were bleeding from their mouths and noses and faces and the vaginas. Then the GIs uh, lighted the exterior portion of the flares and they exploded inside the girls. They, their stomachs just exploded. Well, one day I was driving back, uh, well, driving on a back road and a guy comes over to me and he says he needs some gasoline. Didn't say why. Well, I look over and I see this girl and she's stripped and she's tied to two wooden stakes. I don't know what they'd done to her before I got there. Well, they poured gasoline all over the girl and they lighted it. They lit it and then they just stood there and watched her burn up. It's it, if you look at a body count system and you see if that's the only thing that counts, right, the body count, if that's, if that's what rewards and punishments are distributed by, if that's your ethic, and if your own command doesn't really care whether you survive, then clearly you're in a world where anything goes. It becomes a brutal Or it becomes where part survival. people, it becomes a war for survival or a war to hold on to your ethics. I think a good example of this, Oliver Stone's movie Platoon, which is currently in release, but shows a U.S. military unit that's severely defied, uh, divided between one group who commits atrocities and others who thinks it's a horrible, horrible uh, situation. And I think that's a good, a good illustration of probably the kind of dynamics that occurred in many, many units. It isn't as if everyone is a killer or, or, or a sadist. It's as if you're in a structure mm. where a significant component of your troops engage in such behavior, but not everyone. So it seems that then, you know, we talk about atrocities and we talk about me lie. When you use that term atrocity... It applies an exception to an the exception. rule. That's not a good way no, to look at it here. But me lie and atrocities were just business as usual. Yes. And, and may lie seems a little well organized, in particular well organized, but certainly, certainly may lie wasn't the only village in Vietnam that was burned down and where everybody inside it was shot. That is, that, that is, that is not true at all. In fact, Bill, it was precisely this inability on the ground war to distinguish between friend and foe, VC and peasant farmer that led to the next dimension of techno war, the pacification programs, the fact that they weren't able to tell who the enemy was meant that they had to clear out the whole countryside. Certainly. Simply, if you can't tell friend from foe, then you depopulate the countryside and move them into, refu into concentration camps and move them into urban slums. It's not easy to depopulate a countryside. There are several major techniques. One is defoliation. You simply destroy the food base of the country. And this is where Agent Orange comes in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Agent Orange and Agent Blue and Agent White were sprayed on millions of acres of cropland. Um, other millions of acres of forest were defoliated. So with the food base gone, people have to move. Secondly, certainly bombing attacks on villages, which were quite, quite extensive, discouraged, encouraged people to move. And then third, actual search and destroy operations where villages 
some of which everyone is killed, others of which you simply surround the village, move everyone out, then burn up the village, and move them, uh, remove them, these three modes. Uh, millions and millions of Vietnamese lost their homes and were sent to concentration camps into urban slums. And what's so interesting is the Americans saw this as progress. This was urbanization. Rural is bad, urban is good. So even though they have nothing, it was brought as uh, seen as a sign of progress to bring Vietnamese in where you could show them TV and uh, make them work in American uh, bases and so on and so forth. It was seen as having a, a more sophisticated job than being a peasant farmer. This is also part of that same syndrome of not seeing the enemy in the as uh, a culture or as, as individuals or people, but seeing them just as uh, mirror images of ourselves, like the bombing of North Vietnam was supposed to hurt them if they destroyed their capacity to have consumer goods. Certainly, and so the same idea, you would think from the American perspective that no Vietnamese cared about their home, that they didn't care about their land and their dog and their ancestors' grave and their rice fields and their trees, that instead, simply just to have this new good, have this, quote, consumer good or live in the urban area, that that in itself was just an unmitigated good. You're right, people's lives were not important. The, the, the human dimension was completely lost. And instead, in Americans, then, we can count how many TVs were imported this month, how many Hondas. Yeah, they so the logic fine. of techno-war was inapplicable to Vietnam, in a way. Certainly, that's exactly. It could, in many ways, it could create tremendous destruction, but it could not stop a very powerfully united people who were trying to change their lives. In fact, and this will be our, our topic for our next program. We're running out of time for today. And next week, we'll see the limitations of techno-war, of why it failed in Vietnam. We'll also discuss what's wrong with the liberal and conservative interpretations of Vietnam. We'll see what lessons we can draw from the Vietnam experience. We also will talk about some other aspects of the Vietnam War, the Tet Offensive, for instance. That was a, a big turning point in the war, and a lot of revisionist historians, particularly conservatives, said that it was an American victory. Was it or was it not? We'll also talk about this fascinating phenomenon in which the American army pretty much refused to fight, or many elements in it did. As a matter of fact, they started attacking their own officers and uh, senior enlisted people in this phenomenon known as fragging. And we'll conclude with a discussion of some of the parallels to Central America, of some of the failures of U.S. policy in Central America and how they can be illuminated by the failures of the policy in Vietnam. So, Bill, thanks for coming tonight. Well, thanks, Doug. This was thanks, an interesting, Frank. informative discussion, and we'll look forward to next week. I'll be there. Thank you for watching Alternative Views. We'd like to thank our director, David Galasich, our audio person, Richard Jones, our three camera people, Kelly Sweeney, Judy Burton, and Brian Lynch, and of course, Austin Community Television, ACTV. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. If you have any comments, questions about Alternative Views or suggestions, Please write to us at this address.